where this, thing's may, uh, this, this thing may uh, occur. Well, um, you could very well have something like this. Minimize. <clears throat> u of x squared plus u prime of x minus 1 squared dx over For instance, over um, over this. So the admissible functions are functions that started. Uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. U of one. The function started zero. End is zero, right? But What you minimize is the square of u plus the square of u prime minus 1. Okay. Is this like a boundary value? It's, it's not a boundary value problem. It, the order Lagrange equation will be a boundary value problem. But think of this in the context of variational problem. What you have is you have, basically you have, uh, you can imagine curves, you know, the start at zero, end at zero, right? And that you take that integrand, right, for, for each such path, and you integrate and you see where, you know, which one's the minimum. It's not obvious. Why is it not obvious? Well, you see the integrand is positive, right? So ideally, sort of, if you didn't have any restriction on u, you would say, well, actually not ideally. Could you have actually the thing to be 0? Well, no, because u, if u is 0, then u prime is 0, so then you have 1 squared, right? So the function all along The integral of 0 square plus 0 minus 1 square. <clears throat> so this is 1, right? So it's conceivable that you could actually minimize and you know, or get smaller value of, of, this, of this functional by another path okay now think about the following path if you start close to you know if you start with this with this quantity to be close to zero like u prime is one means u is like a linear function right if it's a linear function Then maybe maybe it's better to go like this, and then very quick down to zero, right? At least on this area, if this is a straight line, then the second quantity is zero, right? Of course, there's going to be some some portion where u prime really is big, right? But that's going to be on a short period, sh short interval. So it's conceivable that you can make the second part of the integrand very small, right? Or to integrate to a small number. And then what's the first integrand going to integrate to? Just uh, x squared, right? x, u is x.
for most of the time. And then it's the integral of x squared. It's what? One third, right? So it's conceivable that you can actually make this integral. So again, I'm talking about u of x equals x here, which is not really feasible. So maybe, maybe I can actually give you this example uh, where, let's say the restriction is only that u at, 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 at 0 is 0. Yeah. Then this is feasible, right? Then this function takes the value less than the value there, right? Now, of course, if we set, you know, so th that will correspond to the actual case when you don't, don't restrict, um, You don't restrict this, so you don't restrict the end point, the right end point here. Then this would be feasible, right? And so forth. So you could actually um, imagine, I mean, that type of minimization problem, you could kind of understand or study, examine this minimization problem from that point of view, right? What are the ingredients of the, of the integrand do? Well, if you have that, you explicitly and u prime explicitly, then there is always a trade-off, right? And obviously, you, you really want to add those two contributions of u and u, u prime to be able to say that I can minimize, right? So that, that expression, I think, looks convex, at least in u prime, right? As well as in, in u. So the, there seems to be a minimization, uh, like an optimal solution, right? But how to find it? That's the whole, that's the whole um, strategy. OK, so back to general case. And we'll see other examples. But um, <clears throat> For now, let's let's talk about this case when both ends endpoints are fixed. Okay. And you're assuming u is continuous everywhere, even at the endpoints. Yeah. Continuous and differentiable, so you can talk about the derivative. So I want to minimize this. I want to minimize this, this integral. Okay. So same thing. If u equals u star is a minimum minimizer for i, or for this problem, let's call it this problem, variational problem for vp. then <clears throat> necessarily the derivative, so when you make a, a variation in this direction, in a direction which gives you um, Uh, admissible path, right? So we want fixed ends at both ends, right? So we want to make up a, a variation 
basically in the direction of phi, where phi takes value 0 at both endpoints, then necessarily this must happen, right? Now, Michael brought a good point that this doesn't actually take into account all variations. I mean, in principle, you could actually take the optimal solution and, and, and perturb it in a way that is not described by this uh, simple expression, right? But among those all variations, you know, if you only consider these variations, then the derivative of, of the functional in this direction has to be zero. Right? So this is the derivative of the integral f of x u of x plus t phi of x u prime of x plus t phi prime of x dx. And this is at time t equals 0. Or at, at t equals 0. Okay? So, <clears throat> well, just so I can save some space, is it okay that I, that I integrate or I differentiate inside now? Rather than outside of the integral? Yes, no? So it's the, in the derivative with respect to t of the integral with respect to x, so you can interchange that. You can differentiate with respect to t inside and then differentiate with respect to, I'm sorry, differentiate with respect to t and then integrate with respect to x. Okay? And now, let's see, this is again a chain, right? So it's a chain rule where I differentiate with respect to t, and t appears in two spots here, right? So it's a differentiation chain rule for function of three variables, if you want. <clears throat> so let's call uh, the, the kind of the placeholders. The first variable of f is x, the second is lambda, and the last one is psi. Psi is the placeholder for where the derivative goes in, right? Lambda is where the functional function u goes in. So maybe here I should say f of x lambda psi. It's unfortunate that we use lambda when you know we should be using something else since lambda is used in Lagrange multipliers. This has nothing to do with that. Um, I guess here lambda is just another Greek Greek letter. Um, okay. Then we're going to be using f sub lambda is the partial of f with respect to lambda, right? F sub c is partial with respect to c. Okay? So, continuing the chain rule, there's no t in the first component, huh? in the x component. So that, there's nothing there. The first time it appears is in the <coughs> u component, in the lambda component, right? So it's going to be f sub lambda evaluated at x u of x, and now I'm going to put t equal to 0, so I don't write that again, and u prime of x times the coefficient of, of t, that's phi of x, right? Chain rule. So as I differentiate the function with respect to the corresponding variable, that's the second variable, so that's f sub lambda, and then times the derivative of the with respect to t inside, so that's phi of x plus f sub psi 
And now I do it with respect to the third variable, so that's x, u of x, u prime of x, phi prime of x, dx. Okay? <clears throat> and now, in this second part, we do integration by parts. So it's going to be integral from a to b, f sub lambda, phi. Let me let me kind of buy, uh, uh, hide the the, the 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 arguments. dx plus integral from a to b, f psi, phi prime. Right. So that's the first integral stays the same, and now the second interval is d by dx f psi, so just like before, times phi. Why do we... okay, and from this integration by parts there's another term which says f psi times phi evaluated in a and b, right? But what do we know about this term? Zero because again phi is chosen to be zero at both endpoints. So this is back. Combine the two integrals in one is basically f lambda minus the derivative with respect to x f psi phi dx. And remember this is zero for all phi's that satisfy, you know, the zero at both endpoints. Okay? Same argument as before, says if the integral of a, you know, this is just a function of x times any function of x that vanishes at the two endpoints. If that integral is zero, that means that the function of x has to vanish. Okay. Now, uh, that kind of looks too weird. So let's let's write back. Let's write back what the uh, arguments were. And again, you could have just carried them away uh, along, but. In the end, it's, it's just uh, putting that back in, right? So, what is this equation, which says this expression has to be identically zero, zero for all x, right? This uh, expression only uh, involves u. Yeah. So, if I give you an u, you can check whether this left side equals zero or not, right? There's no phi, there's nothing, right? So this equation is, 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 is pretty remarkable, and it's called the Euler-Lagrange equation. And that's the equation that a minimizer has to satisfy. OK? If it is a minimizer, it must satisfy, it must make this expression identically equal to zero. Through that argument, right? If, if, it's, if it doesn't make this expression equal to zero, it means that you can manufacture a direction in which you can go and have a derivative not zero, meaning it's either positive or negative. So it's either increasing or decreasing. So in either way, in either case, you could minimize even more, right? You could go even lower with the, with the functional. Okay, so that's a necessary condition. Okay, so this is a so Euler Lagrange equation must be satisfied by 
a minimizer of the variational problem. That is, EL is a necessary condition of optimality. Okay? Well, <clears throat> that's pretty much the same as saying in finite dimensions the gradient equal to zero is a necessary condition to have a minimum. Yeah? It's not sufficient because you may have gradients equal to zero at solid points or at maximum points, right? But this is sort of saying the gradient is equal to zero. And in fact, the the left side, left hand side of the Euler Lagrange equation, that is F lambda minus derivative with respect to x f psi plays the role of the gradient is called the variational derivative And it's saying that if that's zero, you know, then it's possibly a minimum point. If it's not zero, it's not a minimum point. Okay? All right. So, so, um, And sometimes it's actually denoted by this thing. <laughs> just, just like if you, you're, you're going to see this in some books. I mean, in most all books, you're going to see that. It's not a derivative, right? Because I don't have, but it's a variational derivative. Meaning that, what does that mean? Again, it means that this quantity. Apply to a to a direction phi is is the integral of this expression times phi, and at a minimum that has to be zero, right? Okay, so that's just kind of to make the analogy with a gradient, okay? All right, so now let's see in, in a specific example how, how do we do this. <coughs> so let's just take uh, the one I showed you earlier. Let's see, I don't want
little bit of record, but let, let's, let's just, I mean, this is a, this is a perfectly uh, good variational problem. Minimize that thing over uh, both endpoints being, being prescribed, okay? Then the order of Lagrange equations are the following, okay? Well, let's say what is F? There's no x dependence, right, per se. So the only one is, is u dependence, so it's lambda squared plus psi minus 1 squared. Okay? Again, college algebra. This function, when you plug in, so this expression here should be f of x, u of x, U prime of x. Okay? I mean, really, there is no x dependence. Sometimes you can just ignore this. Okay? So, what is um, the order of Lagrange? It's always f sub lambda minus the derivative with respect to x, f sub psi equals zero. Okay, so what's f sub lambda? Two lambda. What's f sub psi? Two psi minus one. So how do I write here? Two u of x, right? Because remember, this is always evaluated at x, u of x, u prime of x. Minus derivative with respect to x of 2 u prime of x minus 1. So 2 and 2 cancel, so it's u of x minus u double prime of x equals 0. So it means u double prime of x equals u of x or minus u of x equals zero. And what is the other condition? Yeah, that's the problem. not a problem. Um, is it okay if I... Okay, if I say it like this, then what's the solution going to be? This is a second order linear in U, right? You know how to solve them? Just second order linear constant coefficients, right? So you find the characteristic equation. So u of x is c1 e to the x plus c2 e to the minus x, right? And you find c1 and c2 so that the boundary conditions are satisfied. So it's a boundary value problem, okay? But uh, forget this fancy term. It's just a second order linear constant coefficient equation that you do in 340 <coughs> and you know you don't have initial conditions that is u0 is something and, and u prime at 0 is something but you have two conditions you know um, but you know in this case if I put 0 at both ends it's actually going to happen what? 
that c1 and c2 are both zero because u equals constant zero is a solution is a solution to this, right? So that just says that the Euler Lagrange equation has the only solution u equals zero. Okay. So you know how to do that? Sorry, this is not derivative. At one is what? C one e plus C two e to the minus one is zero. When you solve this you get You can, you can also see that u satisfies that trivial. u equals zero satisfies that equation, right? <clears throat> okay. So what's the conclusion here? The only possible minimizer is u identically zero, right? which gives the, we computed that, minimum of i of u over all admissible u and it ended up being equal to 1, right? Why can we claim that this is actually um, the minimum. Well, if we can check that the functional is actually convex, okay? Right? You have an if if we check this is convex, then we know, you know, uh, you have a minimum and it's unique, right? If it's strictly convex. So how do we check that it is convex? Well, now it's a little bit more complicated because you know the function is actually the the integrand involves u and u prime, right? So um, enough to check that f, which is f of x lambda and psi is jointly convex in x lambda and x and psi, excuse me. What does it mean jointly convex in this? Well, sort of why do you need jo jointly convex? Because tu plus 1 minus tv and T u prime plus 1 minus T v prime, you'd like this to be less than or equal to T, t f of x u u prime plus 1 minus T f of x v v prime, right? This will give you convexity for the functional. So it has to be convex when you take a linear combination of this and actually, yeah, same linear combination of these two, right? So let's take lambda squared plus psi minus 1 squared. And let's see, how do we check this is convex? It's just a function of the variables, right? How, how, do, how do we check that it's convex? Um, in both 
lambda and xi, function of two variables. Well, the practical way is the Hessian, right? What's the Hessian? 2, 0, 0, 2, right? It's positive definite. And this is independent of lambda x i. So it's it's everywhere, right? So remember the Hessian has to be semi positive definite everywhere. Of course if it's constant everywhere, you, you know, that's <clears throat> so this is joined to the convex, right? Um, so the answer is if I if I consider this this minimization problem with this boundary conditions or with this phys with this admissible uh, paths, then that's how I get the minimum, right? What if I change this and say u zero is zero and u one is something else? Then that will just translate into the solution of that second order linear constant coefficient. You find difference C1 and C2, right? The more interesting thing is what if there is no prescribed boundary condition at one endpoint? These are called the natural boundary conditions. So that's if I have the minimization of. If I'm minimizing a functional restricted only to, fun to, to, uh, 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 to paths that are fixed at one end, but no, so no restriction at x equals b. So it's a free, you can, it's, it's a much broader admissible region, right? You allow much more you know, conceivably you're going to have uh, the minimum of this is going to be smaller than the minimum if you restrict the paths to a fixed uh, right end point, right? Because you're enlarging the feasible or the admissible region by only allowing this, right? Well. We're doing the condition or the computation that says the derivative of this equals zero for all phi's such that phi of zero is zero, but not a phi of a, excuse me, is zero. So remember now. Because I don't have a, a prescribed right boundary condition for u, this is going to be admissible no matter what phi is at the right end point, right? But at the left end point, it still has to be zero. And phi of b arbitrary. What are you going to? Uh, what are you going to get? You're going to get the following. You know, if you kind of, I'm going to go really fast here. This is going to be integral from a to b, f sub lambda minus partial uh, derivative with respect to x f sub psi, right, uh, times phi. Plus, 
there's going to be one term that's not going to be zero from that boundary term. And it is phi xi of at the endpoint B, u of B, u prime of B times phi of B. Again, this survives from the integration by parts. Because phi of B, now it's not zero, it's arbitrary. Okay? But still, this quantity has to equal zero. <coughs> okay? And now is the kicker. It's kind of a weird thing to, to say. If this is true for all phi, it's true in particular for the ones where phi equals zero at B. So this thing has to equal to zero for all phi's for which phi uh, is zero at both ends. So in particular, this Euler Lagrange still has to be satisfied. So no change there. OK? <clears throat> but but now let's take a phi that is not zero at phi of b, arbitrary. Well, this guy is zero now. So zero has to be equal to phi xi times phi of b. For all phi of b. Well, it means that f xi at b, u of b, u prime of b, has to equal zero. This is called a natural boundary condition. Okay. Again, it only involves u at b and u prime at b. So let's see that in this So When we minimize only the same functional, so it's the integral from 0 to 1, u of x squared plus u prime of x minus 1 squared dx, but only We restrict u to be, you know, prescribed at the left hand point, u1 arbitrary. Of course, you don't. If you don't specify, you don't write it. But you know, keep in mind that that means the right hand point can be anything, right? So then you can consider other functions as well. And you saw that you could go farther below one, like one third. Yeah? Well, let's see what's the lowest you can go. Well, we, we, we know what f of x lambda xi is. So that's lambda squared plus xi minus 1 squared. f lambda is 2 lambda. f xi is 2 xi minus 1. OK? So what is the um, order of Lagrange? Well, it's the same thing. U double prime minus U equals zero. Yeah? U of zero has to be zero. That's to be admissible. And what's the natural boundary condition at the right air point? This quantity at b has to be equal to 0. So it means 2 u prime at b at 1 minus 1 equals 0, which means u prime at 1 has to equal 1. f sub xi is twice xi minus 1. So what's this when you evaluate that at a at, at, at B. That's going to be twice U prime minus 1.
Again, if this gives you a solution, there will be a possible minimizer, right? Well, we've we've done uh, we've seen that now. Let's see. So now we know the general solution. So this is u of x equals c one e to the x plus c two e to the minus x. C1 plus C2, that's U of 0, right? Has to be 0. <clears throat> U prime at 1 is what? C1 E minus C2 E. Equals 1, right? So C2 equals minus C1, so that means C1 E plus C1 E to the minus 1 has to be 1, so C1 has to be 1 over E plus E to the minus 1, and C2 is minus that, right? So what's the solution? plus e to the minus 1, e to the x minus e to the minus x. Let's double check. At 0, this is 0, right? And at 1, well, the derivative of this is this plus that, and it's 1. Yeah? So the minimum of i of u is going to be i of u star, whatever that is. I mean, just plug in u star into the functional, right? What can we say for sure? It's less than the value when u equals x. I mean, not that it's that special, but it was easy to compute, right? <clears throat> so that wasn't a minimizer. And it wasn't a minimizer because the derivative Isn't u of x equals x? <laughs> yeah, the u of x equals x doesn't, doesn't solve the Euler Lagrange. Right? You take you take the second derivative of this, you get zero. So that doesn't solve that equation. I was I got worried. So yeah. So that's not a solution. So the Euler Lagrange really restricts. You know, even even uh, forget the boundary conditions. Just writing the Euler Lagrange equation, you get a, you get an equation that restricts the possible the i mean the search for solutions right for the for the optimiz for the optimal solutions um, <clears throat> by the way that's something that we're going to be using quite a bit uh, so since you know when you when you take calculus two you never do hyperbolic sine and cosine um, there is this there are these two very important functions, hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. And it's actually even good to know the graphs. As you can see, this is just, what is it? sine hyperbolic of x over cosine hyperbolic at 
zero, right? At one, thank you. So anyway, it's a, it's a scalar multiple of, of sine hyperbolic. So how does sine hyperbolic look like? Well, it's an odd function, right? It's 0 at 0, and it goes like crazy here, right? I hope I'm right. And cosine hyperbolic is, is an even function, and it goes like crazy again uh, at infinity. So in the so the optimal solution was basically you know a scalar multiple of this scalar multiple so that the derivative at one was was one right but that function was giving you the minimum of that functional okay um, I've assigned already some homeworks for. Monday, but I, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to start now and tell me tomorrow if you have troubles. Um, and also, there is an example worked in the book, and I think <laughs> I have no clue why. Yeah, I may have to change problem eleven because that's worked out in the book. Actually, I just discovered. Um, but look through the example examples were five eleven on page one fifty eight. So C example five eleven page one fifty eight where basically it's the same integral the interval is slightly different and there is no restriction on either boundary that means it's like a you know any function right but to minim to get a minimizer you have to put the natural boundary conditions and you saw the natural boundary condition at, at the right end should be derivative equals 1 right and the same at the left boundary condition you'll see the derivative equal to one as well, and you can you can think about how to justify that. But um, okay, and basically that will give you the the u double prime plus u. I mean minus u equals zero, and the boundary are u prime at zero and u prime at one, are both one. I'm sorry, the it's log of two. I mean. The reason why they choose log of 2 is just so it's easier to plug in e to the log of 2 is just 2 instead of e to the 1. It doesn't have to do with the... Anyway, so that's, that's the only uh, difference. Um, also, by t uh, for tomorrow, what I'd say is um, look at the other examples. There is another example, 5.12. Um, where page 159 where the minimization is of the similar but look at the condition or restriction so the restriction is now it's it's not a fixed end the left end is not fixed but it's not arbitrary. It has to be between two and three. Okay. Um, how do you deal with those situations? Well, first of all, the Euler-Lagrange equation will be the same no matter what. Okay.
the first attempt is to say that uh, the derivative, you, you use the natural boundary condition at the, end, at the left hand point, and that translates into the derivative of u at 0 is to, equal to 0. Okay, so you're solving basically a broader minimization problem. You're kind of ignoring this altogether, right? So you're saying, well, if I just have this, I mean, the admissible paths are so that this is uh, satisfied, but I have no restriction on this, right? Then you get the minimization problem like that. Um, so first, solve the minimization problem no restriction on u at 0 okay and what they get here is well they use some sort of they have log log of 2 maybe i should log of 2 here so interval is so that it's easier to so they use u of x they get u of x equals 2 minus 2 fifths and that's the cosine hyperbolic right by the way that's a good exercise to see how to solve second order constant coefficients non-homogeneous equations because the Euler-Lagrange equation gives U, double, U second derivative minus two equal uh, minus U equals two, not zero. So that's so it's a good uh, um, exercise to do. But notice that U of zero is six fifths, which is not in this interval. Okay. So what does it mean? It's not admissible for the original problem. Right? So it means that you have to consider not admissible for the original problem. It means one has to consider the variational problem that has minimizing the this over u of 0 equals 2 and why 2 and not any other number because this is smallest in the interval 2 to 2 3 And the reason you choose the smallest is if you look at the functional, I didn't write the functional, but you can see it here, is u prime squared plus u minus 2 squared. You can see that as you translate, you just need to translate uh, u, that would actually increase. So I'm, I'm sorry. If you translate down, that would actually decrease the the, fun, the the value of the functional. So it's it's really based on the on the expression of of the of the functional. It's not it's not really a general fact how to how to pick that uh, boundary condition if you have sort of an inequality. Um, but in this case, you know, the boundary six fifths is not admissible. So you kind of translate it up until you kind of get it admissible. All right, so see you tomorrow in Science 2, 244.